And that's the goal of this talk is to identify uh, wickedness within us. If you stick through on this, you're going to certainly learn something that's helpful to you. So let's start with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful and kindle on them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit and they shall be created and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful. Grant that by that same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So the general theme is about, how, about the nature of man being a human, uh, our animality becoming like an animal, or becoming, as you can see those characters at the end of the first line there, uh, it's shin Tav Nun, which are Hebrew characters, and that's Shatan or Satan. Um, they will say, and the the Jews when they talk about this will say Ha Satan or the Satan, the adversary is what that means, the enemy. So you become an enemy, basically somebody filled with rage and vengeance and uh, manipulation, or you are an animal who doesn't care; you're just looking to fill your belly. Or you're a man, and we know what a man is. A man is in this point between heaven and hell, struggling uh, to be honest and also struggling with the animality underneath. So these are the three uh, types of beings that we can become and we can take part in, and we're going to talk about that process. So Freud is, um, again, he's extremely important, and we're going to, uh, in, in psychology, we're going to consider his, his ideas of the id, the ego, and the superego. And we're going to look at some other theories, again, to, to buttress Freud in Hegel and René, René Girard. Um, and we will uh, then take those ideas and we're going to apply them to the apocalypse, the dragon, the beast, the woman, and talk about the process of becoming evil. And we're going to use Dr. Uh, Scott Peck's book, The People of the Lie, to give us to kind of um, embellish or allow us to, to add on the idea of deception to uh, Freud's conscious versus unconscious. Uh, study, and, um, and then we're going to talk about the way to salvation. We're going we're gonna to go over a couple of ways to avoid this fall and to go forward and uh, and to survive. Um, and um, in the and we're going to look at the the soteriological model of re uh, that's the way we are saved model of recapitulation, and um, and and how to become truly human. So Freud is is the most influential and well-known psychologist in history. He gives us the concepts and where he has a number of things he talks about, such as, you know, he talks about Oedipus complex, which has to do with children and their mothers and the idea of people to the opposite gender, etc. But uh, we're going to focus on his id, ego, and superego in large bets of the, the core of what we're going to talk about. And these are basically different parts of our mind. Uh, and that, but we're also going to look at some lesser well-known but crucial to our discussion ideas, ideas of identification um, through cathexis, object cathexis, and I'll describe what that is, and um, the concepts of eros, or love, and death. Um, Freud's interest was in the relationship between the conscious and the unconscious. And we'll connect these concepts with the, the idea of deception and with all those brought together we're going to try to give, make a cognitive map, a mental map of how uh, evil enters, how we become evil, and how we can avoid it. It is remarkable how differently a primitive man behaves. If he has met with a misfortune, he does not throw the blame on himself, but on his fetish, which has obviously not done its duty, and he gives it a thrashing instead of punishing himself. Thus we know of two origins of the sense of guilt, one arising from fear of an authority and the other, later on, arising from fear of the superego. The first insists upon a renunciation of instinctual satisfactions. The second, as well as doing this, presses for punishment, since the continuance of the forbidden wishes cannot be concealed from the superego. So we're going to start from the end. <coughs> um, Freud talks about the superego at the end. The id and the, and the ego are kind of the foundation, and the superego is then added on. But we're going to start with the superego, and the reason we're going to do that is because he, he talks about in his, some of his later works 
the super ego being the 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 foundation of 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 all disorder in the world basically all psychological repression comes from the way that our super ego is constructed and so we're going to we're going to look at it uh, as an as the goal of uh, of all things here in the beginning before we go back and look at the id and the ego the super ego is is like it, um, like the the ego, like the um, id, the super ego is unconscious. It indicates it's like our, our signpost for living correctly in life, and so we see um, it is constructed in our life according to Freud by um, things like the police, the churches, uh, family, uh, the state, and 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 all of the, the 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 backdrop of history in which we were raised, the culture that we live in, etc. It's something that helps those in power, as indicated in the audio that you just heard, assuming the audio worked, uh, that a fear of authority um, does not give you guilt. You're, you're fine deceiving authority as long as you can put on the right image, but the superego lives on inside of your conscience, pricking you with guilt. And so it actually aids those in power. It aids the authority structures uh, in society to, um, to bring you into subjection under the, author in, under the authority. And um, now, when a concept I want to talk, I want to consider here is that um, sometimes we have we, we appear to have more than one instance we might say of super ego. Like for example, and this is not part of Freud, but I think it's it's an idea to think about here. If a kid's at school, among his friends, he will swear, he will make fun of his parents, he will make fun of his teachers, he will uh, prioritize thrills. And he will be likely to ostracize other children. But when he goes home at night and talks to his parents, no longer are those things ide ideal uh, types of ways of living and acting. He takes that whole set of super ego um, ideals and he puts them under the surface. So a large subset of what he believes is good, he makes evil. And he's now picked up the goods of his parent. And this is, of course, a lie and a deception. But we do it between different parts of our life. And so I want to give that idea that sometimes there's things that we think are right to do in one instance, but we don't think they're right to do in another. At the very beginning, in the primitive oral phase of the individual's existence, object cathexis and identification are hardly to be distinguished from each other. We can only suppose that later on object cathexis proceed from the ed in which erotic trends are felt as needs. The ego, which at its inception is still far from robust, becomes aware of the object cathexes, or tries to defend itself against them by the process of repression. So the id, uh, the definition of the id is, is unchecked emotional uh, chaos. It's unconscious. And it's, it, it desires to have its, 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 um, its will satisfied. Um, however... Um, it's it's part of our unconscious mind again uh, with the with the uh, along with the super ego. However, it is constantly thwarted by the ego. the The ego is trying to stop the id's unpalatable desires. It's 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 inappropriate desires from reaching the public. Um, or, but it also it wants to rationalize them because it it also the the ego also knows that it, all of its desires and goals are are in, in the id as well. So it tries to make what the id desires right for society by judging it against the super ego it looks at this idea of this ultimate ideal in which is also called the ego ideal the super ego and it says i need to make sure that it, for me to to satisfy this urge i i i make it right with the with the with the governing authority um the super ego and then I can bring it to reality. So only after you've allowed it to work against the superego or this larger superstructure of rules, then can you bring it into consciousness. Before that, it's not conscious. So um, object cathexis is a really interesting idea um, that that uh, Freud talks about a lot in um, in um, in his in his work um, society and its discontents and. Uh, it's the the idea behind object cathexis, or in I think it's actually in in the um, the ego and the id. 
Um, the, the, but the idea behind object cathexis and identification, this process, is that when a baby, and we saw this, we heard this at the beginning, or I think we heard it in the, in the, last, in the last slide, um, in the, when someone's a baby, object cathexis and, and um, identification are one entity. So the idea is that uh, an object cathexis is like looking at an image. When you're looking at a photograph, photograph your mind is you is doing a process of object cathexis you're imagining this state of yourself being in this position but you're not there another way would be when you're doing imaginative thinking like a like a little kid right you're in the state of object cathexis where you're putting yourself in a place you are not and not knowing you're not there but at the same time wanting to be there this is the differentiation with identification right identification is when you're boots on the ground doing it you're going trying to make you're, you're actually pursuing this objective and doing it so your mind is you are that thing that you desire and so he indicates or he says that it, that babies um, at some very early stage are are in a state where object object cathexis and identification are one which means that when they don't have something like their mother they simply cry they simply lose all 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 control they just they can't they cannot exist without their mother when they want their mother or they want food or they want what they desire but uh, when it's there they're happy when it's gone they're in utter utter anguish and that and that this state and I would say you can extend this back into the animal kingdom not to all animals probably at all times but at the same time the idea that when that which you identify or you want to be doing and in, in the act of cannot be done you, um, you they, they will they will basically just act to do it they will just find a way to do it but um, as you get older you start to play games with how you get things into the process of saying I'm doing this thing I'm this is actually part of me this is what I'm in the act of versus I want to be in the act of that <clears throat> and that that differenti differentiation between want and do is the is the battle between object cathexis and in a sense that's really what we're doing here like as we grow older we we um, developed a, a more and more complex differentiation between the object cathexis and the um, identification a great example of this is chivalry right the whole concept of chivalry according to Freud would be uh, up, up the process of, of um, oh yeah I'm sorry this is about sublimation but um, you, you certainly can see the, the object cathexis is happening in chivalry. So um, in, in chivalry, you want to be with a girl, but you can't be with a girl. So you make this image, this picture of this thing that's different from what you have and what you are, and you, um, and you, you do some sub path of it in order to make it palatable so you're halfway there and you live in the image of holding the doors open for her saying nice words to her defending her in conversation etc white knighting you do these things because you're trying to get closer to a bodily union we'll say with that woman but you can't do it and so you you end up um, keeping this object alive this 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 image alive in your mind while you can't um, actually do what your id wants to do um, and so now the exam when when you have this object cathexis versus identification differentiation this separation between these two this is when sub sublimation which I just mentioned where you kind of live in a state where you sublimation is where you're trying to do the thing you want to do but you can't do it and so therefore you um, you act out therefore you act out a, a secondary um, way of releasing the its desires but at the same time in a positive way so you want to be with this woman in a physical way but instead you open the door for her you say nice things to her it helps the chances of actually getting the its desires realized and it also gets you close and gets the woman to like you so the, this process does facilitate the its desires but it doesn't satisfy them and this process is is called sublimation and you don't know this is happening people who are under sublimation don't understand that they are actually pursuing something that they um, that is unacceptable or that would that, that in a social context couldn't be done they they may to some extent know but generally they don't it's, it's really unconscious as they do these things and 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 but the but the um, it is being satisfied in a small way through this process of faking it and make making constructive action out of what would be um, the id's dark desires. Um, now, on the other hand, there's also something called uh, defenses. I think sublimation is often called a defense, but 
Freud saw sublimation as a as a as a highly positive thing, but defenses other defenses would be justification, and that's um, I'm not going to go through all these for the sake of time, but you could get this is where you say you you give a reason like look I can't do this. I can't do this because there's X, X and Y make it so I can't, I can't serve, I can't act in accordance with the ideal. Therefore, I have basically a get out of, I got a hall pass, I got a bathroom, I can, I can leave class free. I don't have to do it. I don't have to take part in this because I'm not able to, in some uh, justifiable reason. Justifiable reason. Another common one is when you you try to just hide it from your consciousness. And some of these, these are all really very interesting. But basically, this differentiation between the ego and the and the ego ideal um, make us want to. We want to uh, take the id's desires and write them, and so that we want to be one with the ego ideal. And where we have to lie to ourselves, we have to justify, we have to make all of these defenses in order to make ourselves right with the ego ideal. We can't just accept that we are not okay. So the the idea that you are a good person is extremely important to all people. And so we're always trying to be in union with that, which is our our um, set of ethics in a particular context. So let's take a quick uh, break from talking about Freud's mind, um, concepts of the mind, and look at some similar theories. In Hegel's Phenomenology of Mind, he talks about something called the dialectic. It's like a mental journey where the mind has an ideal and um, ideal goal called the thesis. So kind of like Freud's superego, the mind sees its current state as it's not ideal, called the antithesis. As the mind chases the thesis, it discovers a better place in between, called the synthesis, similar to Freud's ego. So we can relate this idea um, in Hegel, uh, in, 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 in um, this highly influential um, process called the dialectic, which is foundational to things, to... to um, ideas theories like communism we can take this and relate it right back to freud's uh id ego and super ego model another thinker rene girard talks about mimetics it's the idea that people claim to choose what they want independently but there's always someone they want to copy we imagine we're like we're like the other person we try to be even better this leads us to things like fashion and um try to look for the the best 10 best practices in something like in bow hunting or cooking, etc. You try to follow those ideals, even though they're kind of arbitrary and you kind of know they are like certain kinds of aprons, certain kinds of products, etc. But it is it also causes problems because we start to compete, we're trying to surpass the others. This competition creates conflict and we sometimes blame others called scapegoating. Here we can see how people focus on an idea like object cathexis. We have this imagination, like looking at an image. And then we try to become it. We try to identify with that thing we're looking at. According to Freud, we spend our lives battling for dreams that we want to identify with in the future. This can lead to conflicts, lying to ourselves, lying to others. As the id wants something, but it seems unacceptable, um, so we use defenses and tricks to get what we want. So now let's dive into our uh, real life story to understand the id, the ego, and the superego in a narrative sense, a quick, short, little narrative. Imagine a teenager in the late 80s who has a, who's a guitarist. He joins a group of metalhead friends. They all play an amazing solo from the song Hanging Right Teen, except for him. He hasn't tried it and instead focuses on more. He, look, he likes Metallica more. He's been focusing more on Metallica than Megadeth. The id in him wants to be the best in the band, but the superego... The cultural commandments of this group of metalheads have a rule. You must play the Hang Routine solo, or so he perceives it. This has entered into his superego in terms of this group. So to satisfy the id, he decides to learn it. He doesn't admit to himself or anybody else that he's copying his friends. Instead, he convinces himself Megadeth is cool. He now likes Megadeth. Here the ego, the conscious, negotiates with the superego to please the id. When he can't play the solo, he uses a defense called justification. He says his past hand surgery makes it physically impossible for him to play some parts. He truly believes this, even though it's not entirely true. Another example would be saying that I'm just big boned when someone is overweight. The phrase combines two defense mechanisms, justification and repression.
I drew the conclusion that, besides the instinct to preserve living substance and to join it into ever larger units, there must exist another contrary instinct, seeking to dissolve those units, and to bring them back to their primeval, inorganic state. That is to say, as well as Eros, there was an instinct of death. The phenomena of life could be explained from the concurrent or mutually opposing action of these two instincts. It was not easy, however, to demonstrate the activities of this supposed death instinct. The manifestations of Eros were conspicuous and noisy enough. It might be assumed that the death instinct operated silently within the organism towards its dissolution. But that, of course, was no proof. A more fruitful idea was that a portion of the instinct is diverted towards the external world and comes to light as an instinct of aggressiveness and destructiveness. In this way, the instinct itself could be pressed into the service of Eros, in that the organism was destroying some other thing, whether animate or inanimate, instead of destroying its own self. Conversely, any restriction of this aggressiveness directed outwards would be bound to increase the self-destruction, which is, in any case, proceeding. At the same time, one can suspect from this example that the two kinds of instinct seldom perhaps never appear in isolation from each other, but are alloyed with each other in varying and very different proportions, and so become unrecognizable to our judgment. So, um, Freud talked about two opposing forces in our minds, and this is what he just went over in a very high broad way. Uh, one is Eros representing the drive for procreation, expansion and joining into communities. The other is Thanatos. He doesn't say the word here, but he does in other works, in other parts of this work. Um, and again, this is uh, this is um, civilization and its discontents. We mentioned the name of this book earlier. The other is Thanatos, the, the death drive, representing the the opposite: reduction, implosion, and focus on oneself, going to a sing a, a singularity, literally going to a cold nothingness at the root of all things, where where absolutely nothing exists before creation, is kind of the idea at the at the culmination of Thanatos. But he takes he, uh, Eros is basically this um, fecundity or, or birth is how he uses it. Thanatos, on the other hand, is linked to a peaceful death. So, and unlike, and you can see pictured these, these women on the right, unlike the Keres or Keres sisters who represent violent deaths, uh, Freud noticed, that, uh, Freud, on the other hand, sees Thanatos as representing a gentle or a calm death. And, and uh, Freud noticed that Eros's work is quite obvious. For instance, when someone desires physical intimacy, the ego can redirect this to a desire for a family, making the id's desires acceptable. This supports life and community openly. However, Thanatos' work is more hidden. It involves things like death due to substance abuse, alcoholism, or unhealthy lifestyles. These deaths often go unnoticed and are accepted, and are accepted by society as uh, just the background, things that are just going on. You don't really think about, you don't associate an alcoholic's death with alcoholism half the time. You don't associate people who die from obesity with their obesity. And the reason why is because these are hidden in the background. Thanatos kills silently. He kills through, uh, he, he tries to cause the death, uh, the death of civil Another great example is somebody who lives for themselves, um, doesn't have a family, likes to go on vacation, has no kids, etc., you can see that death drive at work in their life. As they go from the beginning to the end of their life, they end up becoming an ultimate death, and they don't build anything. They work for themselves, and they, and they, they don't take part in community, etc. They just live doing vacations, etc. They don't see themselves as an agent of death. But ultimately, they, that's what they were doing, and Thanatos has been at work in them silently because this is this hidden, um, under-the-surface uh, death drive uh, that Freud... Freud he, he, he talks about the dichotomy or the difference between in our in our for example in our in what we quoted just now he talks about the how eros is clear and plain you can see it but thanatos or death you cannot see it's hidden like bobby's parents they dress well go to work on time pay their taxes and outwardly seem to live lives that are above reproach the words, image, and appearance, and outwardly, are crucial to the understanding of the morality of the evil. While they seem to lack any motivation to be good, they intensely desire to appear good. Their goodness 
is all on the level of pretense. It is, in effect, a lie. This is why they are called the people of the lie. Actually, the lie is designed not so much to deceive others as to deceive themselves. They cannot or will not tolerate the pain of self-reproach. The decorum with which they lead their lives is maintained as a mirror in which they can see themselves reflected righteously. Yet the self-deceit would be unnecessary if the evil have no sense of right and wrong. We lie only when we are attempting to cover up something we know to be illicit. So now let's look at what we learned about Freud's ideas and let's take it a step further. We've discussed the unconscious, the id and the superego, the conscious, the ego, how ideas move from id to consciousness through object cathexis or cathexis and identification, leading to actions related to death, thanatos, or life, eros. Now we'll add a new layer, the concept of deception. This means that even if an idea is brought to the awareness of the ego it is, and is acceptable to the ego ideal, it might still not be okay for certain external communities like law, school, family, and politics. The person might hide this idea, planning to live by it, but not willing to share it with others. So it's something that is okay with his, this, or his or her internal ideal, but he has deceived the outer community. So he feels no guilt doing the action, but the outer community would not accept the action or would put some type of scorn or shame upon the person for bringing it to public. And so therefore, there's a differentiation between what you're willing to do inside and what you're willing to present to the outside. In some cases, this hidden idea might even drive them into to harm others, like stealing or cheating. So besides the person's internal thoughts and feelings, we're also considering how they try to influence the thoughts and feelings of those around them. Scott Peck talks about this in The People of the Lie, that those who don't fit neatly into our usual understandings of mental illness, he says it's because we haven't developed a clear definition for what he calls their disease. And he's writing in the early 80s, 1980s, which is essentially a way of describing their harmful behavior and deception. Their disease is their harmful behavior and deception. Um, again, he's... This is something you can. This is something that we don't really consider part of the psychological framework, and it's an interesting thing that we don't. This idea that deception, <clears throat> we we do. I guess there's always been the 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 um, w there's always been the the what we called the um, sociopath or the psychopath historically, but now it's 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 been brought in kind of really focused more on the, on the term sociopath. This person who does evil and lies, they have considered it a mental illness. But really, we do um, kind of leave a wide berth around deception. When people are lying and people are deceiving, we, we kind of assume they aren't. And I think part of that is the model that we have for, uh, for uh, the capitalist model in terms of mental health. You pay for services. You don't want your mental health provider to tell you you're a liar. And so you're kind of wanting to be tickled in your ego. You want to be told that you're doing things right even if you might be lying. So you, you can hide those lies from your psychologist and they're not digging that deep often. And unless you're in the criminal justice system or you're in the, you know, like um, the juvenile detention or the prison system and you're not paying for your services, you're not going to see people um, be willing to bring forth the and talk about in any detail the idea of your lies being uh, the major part of your disorder. So I think we, we kind of sweep it under the rug, and Scott Peck is kind of indicating that we do that. We've always had this grab bag of sociopath or psychopath, but we haven't really um, personalized these ideas uh, for ourselves. Okay, so now I'm going to go a little bit more off script. I don't. I had more written before, and we're going to see how this this goes. I've got some basic bullet points for these slides, and a lot in my mind. But um, so now we're going to talk. We're going to switch focus to the to surviving the apocalypse, or or basically looking at what images were given from the Book of Revelation, and tying them to the concepts we've discussed already, and trying to think about how we should live our life in order not to be to end up in that lake of fire at the end, and to find ourselves in the city within the, the gates of the, of the kingdom of heaven and, and with God in, in, um, in paradise and not, not thrown into the lake of fire. So first of all, I want to talk about the idea of the re-complex. So um, we can see, uh, the, the, so what, what I want to say is when we talk about the outward apocalypse, we talk about the idea of we know that the woman, we've heard, you know, the woman represents both the church and Mary. 
And I would say that the woman also represents inside of us a, a kind of a woman or a Mary inside of us, as well as Mary herself in person, in history, and also the church. And the devil, right, and we all know this kind of, the devil represents this dark force. We can, you can imagine evil government, right? This dark force in government, it also is a being or an entity, right, an existing entity, but there's also a devil within us. And it's important to take that and to, to realize that's true. The woman, uh, the other woman, so we've got the good woman, right? This, 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 this dark woman represents the, um, uh, us, that which deceives and makes things easy for society to, f to fall away from the rules of God and, and encourages debauchery through um, encouraging sin, etc., in different ways, en encouraging giving up, etc. This woman... Uh, in the culture, you can see that in terms of, you know, like you could say the West is kind of doing that to the world. It's kind of saying, hey, just give up on all those things you believe. You know, don't don't worry about the hard line of everything that the church teaches or that we're, we're taught by 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 righteousness and and good good action. Instead, just just go ahead and and take it easy and enjoy yourself. And um, uh, and it provides things like rest, et cetera. So th these concepts are coming out and kind of acting like in a sense, this softening and, and easing and don't worry, life is good, enjoy, drink, be merry, etc., and kind of lean into that softness of life. We can see that happening on the cultural stage. We can also see it in the book here talking about an individual person, or we can see it in a, a cer certain individual people doing this in our lives. But we can also see that there's an element inside of ourself that's doing that with us, that weak element inside of our, ourselves trying to get us to give up, right? Trying to get us to enjoy ourselves on, human, on, 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 on bodily pursuits and things like that and give up on the big questions. And what does it do? And this is really interesting. It unites itself with the beast. You can see that she's united right by the beast there, right? She's riding on the beast in the, in the, on the third beast in the book of Apocalypse. And it, the idea here is that she she is bringing us to beastly activity because that's what she does. She says, don't worry about all those precepts. Instead, enjoy yourself, serve yourself. And in so doing, you become one with the beast. You become like a beast. So one thing I want to really bring home here, I think there's a lot of deception in our culture and uh, in our society, and, and major concepts are hidden from us. So in the English-speaking world, across the board, ubiquitously, you're going to see in the book of Revelation um, this beast translated as beast, right? Well, what is a beast? In our mind, a beast is, is something that's half monster, half animal, or something that is mythical, right? Um, maybe it could be an animal. I mean, the, historically, we know it was an animal, but in our modern thinking, it's not just an animal. But really, you should translate this word, because they would have in the Greek, as simply animal. So it's really important to think about. We look at the second beast is a, is a goat, right? Um, so it's, it's an animal. And to take all of, the, all of the, the horror and the terror away from the beast and instead just realize you're looking at an animal here um, and, and not this mythical thing, but really... What's being talked about here is that this rejection of meaning and pursuing just the simple pleasure, again, lining yourself up with your id, um, is what's happening with the beast. So what we can see is beasts form a, form a continuum between microorganisms all the way to, to uh, well-tamed animals such as cattle or dogs. And in the beginning, according to um, Freud's theory, the, we have identification and object cathexis are one. In other words, an animal wants something, it just does it. It just goes in and does the thing. But as it becomes more tame, right, and becomes more like a human, we see that now it has, it's lying to itself. You see different reasons why it will lick its, it will lick the child of a family. A dog will lick the child of a family. Underneath that is probably a desire. You see this, this differentiation between deep-seated desires and what it does inside of inside of an animal happening as they become more like a human. And so we see this happening with people as well. So an animal basically is starting this process of separation of object cathexis and identification, and a human is full-blown. But what the woman wants us to do, right, is to bring us back to follow our desires, to just simply be one with the idea that you want to eat, so eat. You want this activity, so do it. You want to be here, so be it. So in other words, take 
take the identification and the cathexis and sandwich them, bring them right together. And that's what's happening in our culture to humankind. And so becoming the beast, when we see that in, this, in the book of Revelation, is talking about the idea of, of stop asking questions, stop thinking about the big picture, and just do what you want. What, do they say? what is it? Follow your urge, right? There's a million slogans. Follow your urge. Um, um, what's Nike's slogan? Nike is, is uh, I can't remember, but it's the same thing. The idea is basically you're in charge, you're on top, you're the one. Just do what you want to do. Don't worry about all the rules. So now, interesting quote from from um, from uh, from Saint Ignatius Loyola. Of a government, right? You have that which is the reigning government, um, th that which is in charge has, has actual power, and then you have the political movements that are underneath the surface. These are the opposition party, etc. So in those opposition parties, the, 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 you will see things like agitation. You will see protest marches. You will see, um, you will see riots. You will see discontent. You will see, you will see um, loud bantering, etc. But if the government cracks down, then, then those parties will go silent, right? But when the government is weak, then they're loud, right? You see the same idea behind that. And so what we see here is, in a sense, what if we talk about the word shat, shatan, right, or satan, hasatan, we're talking about this idea of the adversary. The devil is the adversary. And so, uh, in a sense, that's what these political parties are. Um, that which is not in power but is in opposition is the political adversary of that which is in charge. And so this basic idea of this second in charge being united to the devil and how the devil is like that, that kind of slinking in the distance, trying things, but if you fight back too hard, he slinks away. You know, if you if 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 you uh, make a firm resolve, he goes quiet. But when you become weak, well, then then the devil is loud, and this is how the devil works inside of our conscience. This is how the devil works in us. Just like in a government, the opposition party will act when the when the main, when the government is weak, the opposition is going to be lo loud and strong, and may result in revolutions. Did God say that if you take this apple, you will die? You will not die, it says in, in Genesis 3. And this is attributed to the serpent or the devil. So the idea is that, is that um, the devil tells us truthful lies. So it's true that Adam and Eve did not die when they, when they took the apple, but they did die in the long run, and so both were true. But the devil is able to take and weaponize ambiguity. And so weaponized ambiguity is, is at the heart of this background movement, this opposition party, the devil, and that devil inside of us. And again, the devil is uni united to the idea of saying, I will not serve. So again, the opposition, you will not serve. And so in us, the opposition will not serve. And um, so he's working for the long game, a selfish long game, even in, in, in the short term. And this is really important because the beast you can see, if we want to differentiate the dragon or the serpent from the beast, the dragon is pursuing quick gratification of self. You know, have what you want right now. You know, you can see what effect that has. These are things like alcoholism, obesity, etc., are following the beast. But the dragon and the serpent are much more coy and much more careful. They have a long game, so they will. They are already in a position of sub sub form of power. So in a community, again, this opposition is the, is the the most powerful of that, which is opposed to the government itself, and. That opposition uh, is is able to control themselves, be careful, says things indirectly. Again, oftentimes, in these, depending on the type of government you have, they have to be careful the way they speak to oppose the government. Sometimes they have to work entirely silently because their activity is illegal. So the opposition is going to be long game focused. It's going to be working towards its own um, its own deification, its own establishment in government of the, over the over the person or over the state. Etc., but it's going to be doing that in a long game sense. It's going to be doing that in a way which, because which which it, it controls itself in the short run and works for a long term gain, a much bigger hit. It's trying to do a much bigger damage than the beast, which is looking after these short term, quick little things in front of its face. The dragon is looking at something, uh, you know, it, it's willing to go 10 years, 20 years to get to its goal. 
So again, it's the adversary. It's also the annihilator because in the end, things that work for themselves in this long game, so this secondary party that's working against the government ultimately wants to destroy the government. It's not presenting something that's, that exists. There, might, there would be maybe something that could come up here depending on a new life coming in, but it itself, the adversary movement inside of a government or the adversary movement inside of a person is working to destabilize and destroy. And that's its main goal. Its, its main goal is not to build something. Its main goal is to take something down. And so it's really important that it is an annihilator. It's a deconstruction company. It's, a, it's going out to do demolition. And uh, so, it, so it's, not, it's not putting something forward. It it's ultimately is, is a, a force of annihilation. And if you take it ad infinitum or if you take it to its, to a, on a spectrum to its, to its fullness, it is uh, just a destructive force trying to trying to ruin and end um, that which is in charge, and it hides behind it. And this is important. So we got the dragon right coming up out of the sea, and then we have these beasts that get that emanate forth, right? And so the he, the the dragon is behind the beast and the woman. The dragon uses the woman to calm the beast and to create the beast inside of us. So we think that we're just enjoying ourselves. But ultimately, there's an evil behind us. Now, this brings Doug, or, um, um, Scott Peck's book in, the idea that, that it's not just the id. Behind the id, there's something else. We could say the snake behind the id, right? There's a serpent behind the id, which, it, which has a long-term goal, uh, like a spider with a spider web, of getting us tangled deeper and deeper and deeper into its web before it finally emerges from its little cave to eat its prey, right? So there's something with a longer-term goal, and ultimately, it's just destruction. It just wants to bring everything to destruction. But that behind this, there is a mind. So behind the beast, there's a mind of evil. And he's noting that, and he's in, in his book, People of the Lie, he brings that out. The woman, there's two different manifestations of the woman. There's the woman of 1112, and behold... A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon is under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she waited in travail to give birth to a man-child who would rule the nations with a rod of iron. But behold, a great red dragon ascending from the sea waited to devour the child as he was born. So we see this woman, the righteous woman, right, represented by the church. Uh, and she's, she's pregnant, crying out in pain as she's about to give birth. And then we have the other woman, right? Then the angel carried me away in spirit to a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names. She had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She had a golden cup in her hand filled with the abomination, with abominable things and, and the filth of her adulteries. So again, in a sense, you could take, and I don't want to unite these women for obvious reasons in any way, but you could say in a sense this is two faces of the woman inside of us if we talk about this in our psyche, right? These are the urges, the, the what? So how does Thanatos work? Thanatos is going to work towards don't think about it, act like a beast, give up, and that's like acting like the woman of Revelation 17. However, the woman of the, of the conscience, the woman of God's service, so we can call the ego, the conscious, in a sense, we can say the ego of, or the super ego of super egos is righteousness and truth and God's law, right? The woman that serves that is, is trying to bring us to right action. Unity with the super ego, unity with the rules and the, and the, and the edicts and the expectations of, of God's kingdom, right? Or of our society, etc. So we've got two forces. One is one is leading us to death, and it's doing it through making us beast-like. We have the other one leading us towards towards God, towards unity, towards culture, towards society, and uh, towards rules, towards conformity with the community. And it's doing it through open and public things. One is hidden, one is open. One you can see, one you cannot. So I want to quickly talk about this image right here. We see a, big, a keep in the darkness surrounded by deep darkness. And um, we see a couple of, uh, a couple of figures outside that, are, that have red eyes and, are, and are, look craven. They look angry and, and ravenous. And they cling together and they walk away from the keep. There are so many places in Scripture, and this is really important, especially in the, in the Gospels, where heaven is described as a gated community. And 
hell or perdition is described as outer darkness. And to we, we've kind of lost this idea. So we the way that we think of heaven and hell in our modern age is that we are on a trajectory for heaven right now. We're going to heaven. And there's maybe like Hitler's in hell or there's a possibility of some bad people, maybe some Republicans or something or some deeply liberal, deeply leftist people or whatever. Some your political opposition is going to be in hell. But ultimately, we're going towards heaven. But the scripture is very clear. Heaven is a small sanctuary in the middle of a sea of destruction. So we see this in Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding feast. The parable features a man without a wedding garment who is bound and cast outside the wedding feast. We got the parable of the ten virgins who are trying to get in, unable to, um, because uh, some of them are, are left outside because they don't have their, their 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 they don't have oil for their lamps. Wise and foolish wise and foolish virgins, where the door is shut to those who are not prepared. The parable of the net. So nets again, the idea that things are brought into a net, right? We got the fish, we got the net, those that come in. Of course, um, the parable of the of the we can, we have the same parables of the idea of the farm or the garden or the the the, the landowner who's harvesting grain or harvesting wheat. You got the wheat and the tares, but the idea is that there's this gated community. There's wheat on the inside, and what's outside? What's outside? Right? There's chaos. Outside is not saved, but the only thing that's saved is a subset of what's inside. In that in the in that scenario, um, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Again, the idea of a divide, and you have the you have the rich man who's in this this ubiquitous place, but there's this Abraham's bosom. Again, what is a bosom? A bosom's a belly. A bosom's a, on his lap. The idea is it's a special um, single place in the midst of a sea of darkness. Um, it's it's ubiquitous. It's all over the scripture. And then, of course, we have the clear statement of Matthew seven fourteen: for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it. Are few that said very very plainly, and the early church believed this. So it's a really important thing to realize that we're not talking about the idea of everyone's going to heaven, and there might be somebody in our family that goes to hell. No, it's it's ubiquitously everyone's going to hell, and there are those who will be saved. So change the the narrative you have in your head, just like everything else in this world. Change the narrative you have in your head on its head. Turn it upside down, and realize that what the scripture says is very clear: uh, hell is ubiquitous, heaven is the exception. So what we can see from this, 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 uh, these examples, and this is how it's presented to us all through the Scripture. In fact, St. Paul talks about it in these words. Salvation is like a race. So at the id, we're in a equilibrium, right? So when, when, we're just, when we're lined up with the id, when our superego is the id, right? That's when, when object, cathexis, and identification are one. The, the, the small beast, the small, the small bug of whatever sort of animal that is, has a desire and it does it. It just does it. That's all. It does it or it dies. That's all there is. There's do or death. There's nothing else. There's no idea of having this image that waits for, this waiting that begins in smaller organisms and then into animals and into humans is of the process of separation. And you can say that this process where the, where the, ego, ide where the ego ideal is pursued uh, but, but has to be mediated through this, uh, the, through this process of the, uh, uh, the object ideal and the identification with the ideal being separated, this is like f swimming in the swimming pool, right? This is the process of swimming in the swimming pool. As you, be, you start a race, you kick off, and then you're going across and you're swimming. At that point, you're in this, you're, you're you, you have no foundation, you're kind of moving, and this is like our world. We're running, but we have no foundation. We come from this dark state, and we're going to this perfected state where we are one with the ultimate superego, the superego of superegos. <coughs> And so we, we diverge en route. And so we get the idea of the apple in the garden. So again, um, we, man takes the fruit that he's not allowed to, to, to eat through again, again, this, this cognitive, this intelligent evil backdrop, the serpent, which is talking to the beast in us and saying, you can have things for your belly. You can have good things. It's good to eat. You can, it'll make you, it'll, it'll uh, give you power. Again, the it is being tickled this whole time. And so, he takes and eats from this, uh, she takes and eats this, this fruit and shares it with the man. And, and then at that point, we are now separated. We're, we're now liars. And, and God gives us an example. When he, he's walking in the garden, and he says, where are you? And trying to find man. And they said they, that man said that he hid himself because he was naked. So hiding, nakedness, 
deception covering is happening now. All of a sudden, we've brought in this differentiation between the ideal or identification, what we are, and what we present. So now we have a false outer, a false reality where we're, where we're lying to ourselves or lying to those outside in order to um, affect uh, reality. We're basically, uh, we're always um, cheating. We become cheaters. And so God saw this, and that's when man was thrown out of the garden. And um, we can see man is on this walk right now. We, we're walking around with a bunch of charlatans. More or less, right? And we got to make ourselves less. We want to become one with our super ego so that what we do, what we say, what we want to do, what we want to present is actually what we are. So this um, requires openness. You can see this, again, bugs. We see this bottom thing here, bugs to rioters, right? These are the beastly servants of the, of the, of the devil in society. Rioters to finally on the right, this orderly group of religious, right? So in the end, we want to become somebody who is calm, clear, effectual. Our work is in unison. We act uh, with complete uh, correct order and, and attention and, and do things in the ways that, that, um, that, that are pleasing to God. We want 100% to please God. That's the goal. So, and this follows, uh, and so before the year one, there's, there's a number of theories of, of um, how we are saved. Right, for the first thousand years, this was an extremely influential one, and that is recapitulation. It's it, the soteri soteriology is how we are saved, and it's 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 posited by Irenaeus, and it's the idea that basically Christ is going to be is going to be a new head of us. We try to make Christ our new head, so we become other Christs. Right, the the goal is that we conform ourselves entirely so that we are new Christs on this earth, and it's not so that He's kind of covering up our sins and letting us in, doesn't matter about how bad we are, etc. We have to be made perfect through him. And this is the ancient view of salvation. Now we've changed our view of salvation, and I consider that a deception. Really, we need to change ourselves into a perfected form. The walk of this life is required, and we do need to apply ourselves to perfection. And this is what, um, what recapitulation, or the idea of reheading, be, being given the new head in Christ, means and so we want to have that mentality where we are trying to be made into Christ we want to become another Christ we want to become siblings to Christ which a sibling is like his brother or her brother so now I want to talk about the demons delusion and death and so um, I read St. Ignatius of Loyola's uh, idea of how the devil is is like the second in second in charge or a woman uh, versus that which is in charge or the head of the household uh, um, in society in a historical sense. <clears throat> and so we either so we either identified a life or death, right? It, and that's that's what we talked about earlier, that there's this Thanatos drive and this this death drive and this and this life drive or this this eros. Um so what angels do, and this is something that I, I think you can see. It's, it's interesting because um, Father, uh, Father Ripperger states that he thinks that up to one-third, it's either one-third or two-third of all cases of bipolar disorder are actually, are actually um, demonic, uh, not possession, but, but um, influence, Demo de not, de demonic influence anyway, oppression. And temptation or oppression but certainly at that point oppression and so what what is somebody who's bipolar somebody who's bipolar is somebody who gets hyper fixated gets uh kind of can't see the, the the they would say they can't see the forest for the trees they can't look at the big picture instead they're just seeing what's in front of their face they get they get into a plan and then they go on it and then they go into deep depressions um and this, the idea is you're going between pursuing these things doing crazy things in order to get some um myopic or or or, or uh, simple end, and then you and then you give up, and then you go into this despair that you couldn't have what you wanted, etc. And this happens over and over again in a bipolar person's life. Well, this is, I think, what demons do inside of us. So the devil in us will accelerate salience or accelerates importance. He takes things and makes them more important to us. He um, gives sentiment, and so um, it's about clarity and delusion. So when you feel yourself or you see others under delusion, you can see the work of Satan there, in my opinion. Um, this it's 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 this idea. It's kind of funny, but uh, we had a talk a couple weeks ago 
where we criticize the concept of prelist, but really prelist is a manifestation. The idea that somebody is is um, acting in a way which is not in, in, in accord with God's law, not in accord with the tradition. And you can you often see it in their aspect, in their in the in kind of the 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 vigor with which they're moving for this side concept um, is 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 called prelist. Well. And it's the same kind of idea that angels basically increase the salience or importance of something in uh, angels, both demons and angels. So an angel may um, may may give you may actually make things work better for you, help you in your life uh, to bring you out of sin. When you've prayed and God's giving you a grace, he might send an angel to change your focus to right living and you might start working out. You might start losing weight. You might start um, feeling deep guilt for your sins, etc. So good things. But the angel might also cause calamity in your life in order to bring you to God, right? But at the same time, the devil's going to come in and do the opposite. He might make you lose weight in order to get you to fall to sin. He might make you uh, get a better job in order that you will fall to the sin of the sin of um, the sin of pride and the sin of of uh, uh, it's fall to the, fall to the, the love of money, and so both are going to happen. Now we can see this. We talked about this idea of recomplexity earlier. The idea that you can see this at different layers. Well, in society, um, the the Russians, um, there's certain people have come out and admitted to, that the Russians were involved in the in the through the 20th century in a process called active measures, um, translated into English, and. What they what they were doing is they were basically demoralizing demoralizing and taking apart um, American society by um, infiltrating education systems etc. And in this process, they were trying to ruin the population of the country. Um, Sergei Bezarkov is the is the man who you can find online that talks about this. And uh, this is an example of the devil in America, right? Trying to take America apart because it's an adversary. And its goal is not to help in any way, just to bring down, ruin, and destroy the people of the population, to make them into worthless people who can't function and don't work and are weak and easy to defeat. So your enemy will often be working to destroy you. And in, in this sense, um, the USSR was very overtly hiding it, but very overtly in sense of their activity. They were planning and doing and acting um, to bring apart the individual people and the population of America to ruin us. And that's what the devil does in our life. We can see that on a state, on a personal level. And again, um, the devil um, is accelerates revolutionary or rebel movements. He's the backbone of them and in us and, and in society. And again, he's the enemy, just the quintessential enemy. When you think about that which is opposed, that which is t trying to destroy you, that is the same as the devil. So um, in the DSM-4, malignant narcissists are considered, you know, just deeply evil people. And I'd say that th that the way that they're just the way that they're put forward now or talked about in psychology is a little different than they were historically. Doug P or um, Scott Peck in the book People of the Lie identifies those who are uh, who are living in a lie to the to the damage to the destruction of those around them. They're trying to save face to the destruction of those around them as being malignant narcissists. And um, so we're going to work with this definition, the idea that if you walk, if, you, if a person goes into us in, into a situation and says, I know that this is going to hurt the people here, but it's really important that they think I'm a good person and therefore I'm going to lie and hurt them in order to make sure that I look better. If people enter into situations and do that, somebody doing it once and repenting of it and feeling deep guilt is one thing. But if somebody can do that, live hurting and putting themselves on top and lying and living in deception. This is an example of somebody who is a member of the people of the lie. And the people of the lie, uh, uh, Scott Peck, finally goes forward and talks about the, the idea of possession and how people of the lie um, are, are basically possession is a process in this, in this route psychologically. So he's a tying, he thinks there's an, a real devil involved in it too. So a real demonic spirit that's underlying it. But that this, when you're living this lie, this 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 deception with those around you, you're uh, you are you're basically evil, and this is the definition of evil. And this is a malignant narcissist in his definition, somebody who is evil. Um, so in our concept of of object cathexis versus identification or divergence, if you deceive yourself inwardly, right? If if you're deceived, so your own conscious mind doesn't know something, it's called repression, right? Um, 
and other forms of defense mechanisms, but uh, so you don't even know it. But if you do it outwardly, right? Let's say you know inside, but you try to make the outside world not know about what what the reality of an action is. That's deception, right? So we have delusions that happen inwardly, and then we cause deception. We we share the work of the devil when we cause deception outwardly. So we're taking part in this psychological prof process of hiding information and making lies lead and win. So lies are ruling. You're living on a lie inwardly when you don't know, when you're deceived through delusion. You don't understand. You're unconscious. Uh, you're, you're doing things unconsciously. When you try to make the outside world do things unconsciously, you're a deceiver. And this is deception. Outward, outward um, lies cause the outer delusion, the delusion to the outer, outer world, and then in that process, you're a deceiver. So um, I thought I w I'm, I'm going to quickly uh, bring this together really quick before I talk about this dream. So basically, hypervigilance to be clear and open and plain, to realize that you, you have to strive for perfection and that you're not going to be saved. Don't expect to be saved. If you are halfway, if you're, 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 if, you're not, if you're not putting your full mind on something, if you're not putting your full heart into the service of the kingdom of God, you are not going to be saved. And so to realize that's what Christ said, to realize that's what the early church believed, um, and to realize that's what St. Paul presented. And so with this in mind, or the first thousand years of the church, with this in mind, you have to live for perfection. And if you live in a lie, you, you're... you're in danger of hellfire. So I would say one of the most important things we can do, serve God above all things, and in humility, put everything out in the open. Be honest and plain and clear and don't hide. And if you're hiding things, you need to overcome that so that you're willing to talk about things in an open way uh, as, a, as are appropriate, with the people who are appropriate, but you need to make sure that you're, that you're not somebody who lives taking advantage of others through deception. You need to make sure that you are presenting um, the clarity and plainness of of what's inside outside and if you're living with your outside your inside plain with the outside you can't fall into this this realm of being a deceiver which you really want to avoid being a deceiver being a hypocrite so deceivers will always become hypocrites the devil will make sure of it he will make sure that you criticize others for the same things you're doing and this will be in the end and as in, during your fall so let yourself, let your light shine upon a lampstand so all can see the good works that you do and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So I want to close with um, this dream that I had um, that, it, that is really, it's, it was prescient. I didn't realize. It was months ago. So this is probably six months ago. And I had this dream of Thanatos, or Thanos. I, I don't know this, this character on the left here. I never saw the movie. I saw pictures of him. And I had heard that he had he had snapped his fingers and um, half the people in the world, including many of the superheroes in the movie he was in, died. And then I, re I had heard that he was related to this idea of the Greek Thanatos. I didn't. But only when I started to look into Freud did, did I realize that this this had any relation. So I thought this was talking about my brother because Thanos actually looks a lot like my brother Joe who died during COVID. But um, I come to realize that 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 this is Thanos. So in my dream, what happened is um, there was a man, in, there was a crowd, and I'm I'm sitting on a stage, and people are getting presented before me, and I keep defeating them. So it's like not like a boxing match, but maybe a boxing match to the mind. I don't know. But basically, you get up and you can imagine a fight, but there's no blows thrown, and then someone's laying on the ground, right? I keep defeating people one after another, and I'm feeling like all confident that I'm doing so well, and um, and I interpreted this as being in a time of spiritual uh, progress that was being made in my life. Enemies were being defeated, and you could see this. But then in the crowd, I see a picture of this Thanos. And then he walks up on the stage, and he's standing before me, and the dream ends, right? So now he's ready to face me, right? Well, after that dream, I thought that I was just talking about my brother Joe. I didn't really understand what it might be. But after that dream, I gained 30 pounds. So dying through obesity or gaining weight, living um, in, and, and coming apart through these silent deaths, is exactly what Thanatos does. So I think this dream was indi indicating to me that I was facing Thanatos. I was facing the death drive, and the death drive was the next thing coming for me. Um, and so uh, it's after I realized, after I looked at these things, I went on a, a, an austere diet, and I'm trying to go forward and not let myself die to the death drive. Um, but that's something that's constantly hiding in the shadows behind us. 
And I thought that was a really interesting dream. So you see on the right there, that's a picture of kind of the way you might think of Thanatos in our culture. The idea is that he uh, is responsible for deaths of old age and deaths of drug abuse, uh, alcoholism, obesity, um, and um, just slow, peaceful, silent deaths that you really don't notice. Okay, thanks, everybody. This went way too long, but um, we'll talk next week. Talk to you later. Bye. Thanks. I, yeah, I was a little bit forced, but. Was it was it kind of clear what did were you able to get something out of it? Were you able to understand?